Hello, good afternoon and welcome to a special discussion on Slant with Phil Beadle, who is has very kindly joined me for a discussion right now on on the back of his blog about Slant and also his his sort of views on on Slant in general. If you are just joining us, um, this is being broadcast via Teachers Talk Radio on LinkedIn, YouTube and Twitter, and it will also be available as a podcast at some point um, in the near future. Um, and as always, we are talking about an issue that is slant, and at some point we'll interview other people with different views about slant and its role in the classroom. Um, if you don't know what slant is, we will talk a little bit about that as well. It's part of uh, Teach Like a Champion. It's part of the repertoire, let's say, of Teach Like a Cham Champion teaching strategies, um, which many, many teachers will be familiar with. Uh, Phil, um, I don't know whether you want to just introduce yourself really briefly to anybody who doesn't know you out there. Not really, no. No problem. Um, uh, Phil, I think, is an English teacher. Yep. Um, and works at secondary level. Yep. And has also authored various different um, blogs and books around teaching and learning. Yes. So, Phil, let me let me start off because you've written this blog about slant. Um, what led you to write the blog, first of all? And if you haven't seen the blog, you can find it on Phil's um, Twitter page. Uh, there was some controversy, and I, I don't spend a great deal of time on Twitter. Um, there was some controversy this week uh, about a, a degradation of teacher autonomy. And I think teacher autonomy is profoundly important as a motivating factor. Um, and much of that degradation of teacher autonomy comes from, um, one, one might say, schools that are prone to be affected by cultiness. And we're, we're in a situation where teachers are being told that graduate professionals, highly intelligent graduate professionals, are being told to deliver lessons which are scripted minute by minute. Now, this is a creative profession, and it's a creative profession in a very wide church. And I just feel that the degradation of teacher autonomy, and I feel that slant is, slant is kind of a, a, a kind of tangential thing to it, is, is a profoundly bad thing. Okay? And so just very rapidly, just not something, just cut and pasted something out of my last book and posted it up. That's all. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, some of the things you've said. Um, just, just, to, just to sort of open up there, um, do you think that routines are important in the classroom? Yes. What if I understand that, you know, we're going to talk about slant as, as, as one sort of routine, but there are many, many others. What routines do you use in your classroom when it comes to when it comes to behavior? Well, that, that, that's a very, very complex question. Uh, so slant is, that's for teacher delivery and the teacher-led discussion, which as far as I can see, is pretty well all the, the pedagogic tradition that TLAC represents has got on its palette. Um, what what do I use for transitions? And the wasp is back again. <laughs> what do I use for transitions? I get quite simply, I say pens down and look this way. That's it. At no point do I attempt to control their bodies. Though I suppose look this way. Or somebody really left field might consider that draconian. I mean, we'll we'll get into the we'll get into the box. I thought I wanted to ask you that to start with because we are fundamentally we are talking about te about routines here, particular routines. This being, yeah, let me say something about routines. There is a a view of people that don't know a, an enormous amount about how to influence human behaviour that routines is is it basically routines and systems is it. I'm not a systems person. I totally agree that schools have to have adequate behaviour management systems. 
Uh, I use routines myself all day, every day. Um, however, positive behavior management that understands that you're dealing with humans is vastly more complex than just insisting on routines. You know, there's a lot, lot more to learn than that. What, I, I want to sort of pick out some bits that you've written um, in the blog. So if we were to start with this section, it says here, just as an example of the level of symbolic violence being perpetrated on some of our nations and a specific strata of American children, I serve up for your delectation slant that has been imported without being put under any form of cr critical microscope into the UK as a perfectly acceptable method of social control, when in fact it's little more than what Bordio, Bordio. Bordio describes as one of the crudest techniques of coercion. Now, is slam one of the crudest techniques of coercion? It is certainly a crude technique of coercion without a shadow of a doubt, and the people that invented it actually admit that. Uh, I'll read something out from Dave Levin, who was the leader of the kids. Oh, Phil, can I ask you to move slightly so you're in the middle a bit more? I don't want to. Uh -oh. um, right. <laughs> right, here we go. That's very coercive of me. Carry on. This is from Dave Levin. Okay, don't try and control the way that I'm seated. No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare. Right. This is from Dave Levin in apologising, the people that invented it, in apologising to the community for the invention of slum, right? In recent years, I've come face to face with the understanding that white supremacy does not just mean the public and hateful displays of racism. It also applies to all aspects of the world that are set up for the benefit of and perpetuation of power for white people at the expense of people of color. The most common example of this is disciplined practices that center on compliance and control and have not consistently and constructively affirmed, uplifted and celebrated your identities, your communities and our black staff. Now this came about because the alumni of the KIPP schools, and this is coming, yeah, in, in the future, this is coming. The alumni of the KIPP schools identified, so black teachers that have come back to KIPP schools identified that they were profoundly uncomfortable with the experience of having their bodies controlled by white teachers. So even the people that invented it, admit that it's coercive and controlling. Yeah, it's an absurdity. Why is, why is the, intellect, the level of intellectualism of the profession descended to such a level that we cannot see that this is abusive? Yeah, I ask you a question. But there are a lot of non-white people, teachers, professionals, who attest to the positive impact of TLAP and slant. Do they? On students, yeah, for sure. Well, I've never met one. In fact, I have to be honest, every single teacher that I've worked with over the last few years, when Doug Lemoff has mentioned, um, I've got certain other voices that, um, that would argue for what I would term authoritarian draconian approaches, that have always just said it's just fucking rubbish. Yeah, maybe not some of those from, from Teach First who are indoctrinated initially before they find their own game into believing that Doug Lemoff is, is the ultimate guru of teaching. But yeah, I, I have to say, as somebody that's been teaching for 27 years and still teaches, that the idea that I want to be listening to somebody that spent one year in a classroom as, as my, my guide, it's a complete absurdity. But I think I think I think com coming back to what you said about about um, the sort of I mean I mean you've you've mentioned there and you actually mentioned it later on in the blog as well. Let me just find the bit. Yeah, you said um, this set of flawed crutches for the teacher without ability. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with it. I wrote it. Yeah, it's the the issue with this model of delivery of, of content. I've got nothing against the delivery of content, but this particular model of it is so profoundly unskilled. And this is, I'm, I'm writing a book at the moment with the subtitle of which is uh, Why Traditionalism is a Right-Wing Scam. So the, the title is Pedagogy of the Oppressor. It does have a question mark. 
Um, and as far as I'm concerned, as somebody that is, is identified as a progressive, um, they've only got one tool in their toolkit, and it's not enough. Yeah, for me, uh, your experience at school is as important as your outcomes, and we seem to have forgotten that the social adventure of learning is a social thing. Okay, and consequently, young people since you know, this government have come in. Yes, they've had substantial improvements in the degree of rigor, which I utterly applaud, but their experience of school, to me, has become degraded. Why, I mean, just, just coming back to that though, when any teacher sets out teaching of any ability level, so so they decide they want to become a professional teacher. Mm -hmm. And every every teacher out there is going to have, you know, the, there's no one teacher who's the same as the next. So every teacher, however good someone else judges them to be or however good they are, there's going to be different ones in each, each phase. Yeah. So surely every teacher having a toolbox of effective strategies is a good thing. And, and yes, yes, and slant, absolutely. And, I absolutely agree with that. And slant could surely fit into a toolbox of of strategies that it, that it, that any teacher could use, particularly a teacher. I mean, yes, but that that toolbox of of pedagogic palette cannot be abusive. It is part of our professional values that we are not abusive to children, and this may be unconsciously abusive. But even the person that that came up with it accepts that it's coercive control, and that's not legal. But I, I'm going to sort of challenge you there on on this idea of sort of oppression uh, and and sort of um, you've 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 mentioned a few times in the blog actually symbolic violence mm -hmm. um, being perpetrated on on children, right? If you actually pick slant apart. There are the, the first two bits of it are sit up and, and, and listen. So, no, Why? no, but I'm, I'm just going to finish this. Well, I've got to I sit, sit up and listen. Right? And. Sorry, I'm killing a wasp. <laughs> <laughs> Go away! <laughs> Carry on. Um, slam, please, Phil. But. No, I'm not going to. The, but there is an argument to say that that you know, particularly with sit up and listen, these are just this basic. Not, you know, these are just basic fundamental instructions that every teacher has to give to students at some point. No, it's not. Um, listen, yeah, of course you do. But the first one, sit up. Um, you've you've tried to control how I sat twice in the space of how long we've been talking. I mean, I was I was being quite facetious and jokey the I second time, it, but it was interesting. My I had an emotive reaction to it both times. Okay, so that will give you an, an indication as to what it feels like having somebody to control your very being, your body. Yeah. I don't see a problem with it though. If you said to me, Tom, can you can you sit a little bit more in the center of the screen because I'm struggling to see you? or hear you, then I'd say that's absolutely fine. That's an adjustment. That's a reasonable adjustment that I will make for your comfort. Right. We're not going anywhere, really, with this one. Um, let's let's move on. Yeah, I, no, I, I, well, it, yeah I, I don't find it comfortable, okay? And personally, so at the moment, I'm slouching. No, that's um, fine. That's absolutely fine. And, and as I said, I said that's absolutely fine. And I'm not looking but, at you either because I'm thinking, right? Yeah, and that's absolutely fine. No problem with that. But I think what we were getting at was this idea that asking someone to sit up and listen is oppressive. Because that's, uh, that's, what, that's what you said. You said it was oppressive and symbolic violence to, to ask someone to, to instruct somebody or ask somebody to sit up and listen. There are elements of slant which are more oppressive than others. Listen isn't necessarily oppressive, of course. All teachers, when they're delivering content, need to be listened to and the children need to listen to each other when they're in discussions. Of course, listening is a vastly important skill. There are elements in the blog where, of course, I'm satirizing things hyperbolically. Do you understand? Yeah. 
it, a, a lot of my writing and the reason yeah I, yeah I've still got a three book deal after I've no longer kind of a, any interest to people is a lot of my writing is satirical in intent now in satire one exaggerates yeah and so consequently yeah th that that particular satire of that particular coercive and controlling technique is exaggerated so but there are other, the the nod the nod thing is fucking ludicrous and track the teacher is equally ludicrous so but but i have to be clear that you have mentioned each of the s l a n t you know acronyms and you you you've really sort of critiqued all of them under the banner of this is yeah, a slant, yeah. slant is an oppressive. So are you saying that actually N and T are oppressive? Some, some elements of it are more ridiculous than others. There's nothing ridiculous innately of telling kids to listen. However, because I'm writing a satirical piece, I'll point out the comedic. I mean, I, I, I genuinely, I understood that there was elements of satire in in the blog but i i i believed it to be a very serious sort of you know punch at slam well you can make a serious point through humor tom it's yeah it's you, possible. Can, you, you can you can um why, yeah why do you think jerry jeremy corbyn was pictured on the front page of the sun as a chicken yeah the humor is an incredibly effective way of getting a point across I mean, I want to. I want to sort of. Okay, so we've cleared up the bit about sort of. You know, you, you don't necessarily feel that that um, Jesus asking or in, instructing um, a a a student to sit up and listen is oppressive. Um, but I, I think there are there are potentially elements of oppression in trying to control someone's body. Yeah, the listening thing. I, I don't have an issue. So in so in 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 sort of class then. I mean, presumably there's times, I mean, how would you respond if you were in class and a student slouched and put their head on the desk while you were giving an instruction or talking? Say anything about head on the desk. You don't put your head on the desk in my classroom. So how yeah. do you ensure that that doesn't happen in your classroom? I tell you, this is, this is not, not a very high order dialogue, really. I tell them to take get their head up. It's that simple. But I will also talk to them about yeah, how late they went to bed last night and how much sleep they're getting. But there is an instruction there to get their head up. Yes, of course. Yeah, there's, so a, there's that, surely that's controlling the body then. That's asking a student to control their body. That's just you being silly, really. Yeah, <laughs> it's not, it's not, it is. The intellectual level of this is a little bit low. Please can we up it a bit? I mean, I mean, I, I think it was a valid question. If uh, you you said that uh, you said about I'm not sure it's a valid question. I think it's stupid. Well, let, let me read what you said. You've said, sit up, why? Why are you trying to control the way I sit? When I'm thinking, I like to lean back a bit. I struggle to sit up and write at the same time. But more than anything, get your symbol symbolic hands off my body. If you feel you have dominion over my body, then I do not want you as my gentle guide since you no longer qualify as such. Right, so you're, what you're doing now is you're hyperbolically satirizing I'm, me. I'm reading what you said. Well, hyperbolically satirizing me by conflating. I'm reading what you said. And you're know, interviewing someone and not listening to them. Yeah. You are conflating one thing with another. Having your head on the desk and being asleep in a lesson, okay, is not acceptable. But it's not the same as you have to sit up bolt upright. You know, that's, that's a deliberate conflation of one thing with another, and it's kind of insulting. Okay, but I mean, I think it's important to get into that because that's a key part of slant. Sit, sit, you know, you you critique slant. Sitting up is one fifth of it. Otherwise, can we move on? Because if it continues to be at this deeply low intellectual level, I, I can't be bothered with it. Right? Can we move on to the other stuff? Okay. Um, I, I mean, is, is there anything I can ask you about Slant that you've written that you're well, comfortable with me talking about? Why don't you read out the good bits, not the bits that you find easy to satirise? I'm not satirising, I'm just reading through the blog, I, which started with the sitting up bit. Carry on. So, okay, we'll move on to to um, the, the, the nodding bit. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so you've said here, um, nod your head. Are you joking? You haven't thought this through, have you? How often, why, all of us at the same time, the whole lesson? What are we to you? Are we even human? Or are we a whole class of Churchill insurance bulldogs that must be trained in more or less exactly the way that you would train a dog? Um, Good piece of writing, I think. I, I mean, I said, I said on my my feed, it's it's an excellent piece of writing. I do think that when when you write something, you know, it's good to discuss it and actually open up the critique around it. Um, I mean, that bit, I'm sure do, you you will have a lot of people who would support that. So with the with the nodding part, um, I guess that I mean, asking a student to acknowledge maybe that they're in some way, shape or form that they are with you or, or sort of, you know, in the lesson with you or, you know, or, or acknowledging an instruction or whatever it is, you know, I, that could be framed positively. Have you noticed me nodding at you? Because I haven't, I don't think. Okay. Now, have we been engaged in, yeah, really at a point, some quite heated discussion? Yeah. You don't have to nod at somebody to be listening. In fact, probably looking at somebody and listening means you're not properly listening possible okay i it, tend i tend is. i tend not to make eye contact when i'm listening so i can focus on the words so it's probably for all the yeah for all the good that much of cognitive science has done it's probably not in line with cognitive science either and i do think this conflation of teach like a champion with evidence base it's, it's not a very big evidence base, is it? Okay, and and equally, equally, it's evidence. It's evidence based. It's the study of only one style of teaching. Okay, and there are much, much more styles of teaching than just that style of teaching. You mentioned in the blog, um, and it was a quote by some. I can't remember who it was. I'm sorry, but it was someone right. else. And it said, um, "Every detail of students' behaviour is scrutinised and corrected." even that, that which would seem to have little to do with children's academic performance mm -hmm. with regards to slang. And I think this person was actually talking about TLAC in general. But anyway, let's say slang. Um, I was going to ask you, what behaviours in a classroom have nothing to do with a child's academic performance? I have no idea. Yeah, I wasn't prepared for that question at all. Um, I don't know. Behaviours in a classroom, that's such a, a massive thing. I'd have to spend probably... A, half a day thinking about that to answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of slant and TLAC, have you ever seen it in action yourself in, yep. in a school or classroom? Yes. And how did that make you feel? Yeah, I, I've used some of the techniques as well. I didn't find them helpful at all. And in fact, I did, I asked, I had a, just a delightful top set for the last couple of years. And I, I tried, I tried uh, cold call with them. And I did the research into what Dylan Williams says about it and how it's best delivered. And we gave it up after about two days because the class said, no, we don't like this. We much prefer a more, more organic form of conversation. So it's, it's stilted, it's rigid. And equally, it, if you know your students, so for instance, there was a student whom I shall not name, who would had terrible anxiety and would identify herself as vulnerable. If in public I go, I'm going to invent a name. Her name was not Sally. Uh, here's a question, and that's for you, Sally. Sally's likely to start crying. So uh, it's just, this is managerialism, really, just pretending to be teaching. Teaching is much more multifaceted than that. On, on, the, on the point of sort of ask and answer, because that's the third one. We've got S-L-A-N-T, we've got sit up, listen, ask and answer. So on ask and answer, um, are you saying that, is it cold calling that you sort of have the issue with? Or is it just sort of uh, asking students to verbally answer questions out well, loud? I, I, yeah, I think it takes away a great degree of professional judgment. Part, part of professional judgment is knowing your students. And part of your professional judgment is knowing that that one in particular is really shy. That one's going to go to pieces if you ask them something. It's, to, to, we're, we're putting blanket solutions here. And very, 
blanket solutions with you know, ridiculous acronyms on the multifaceted thing of educating a class of children. And to put this, put them in this rigid box and expect them all to develop. And there is another serious issue with neuro neurodiverse kids. Yeah, asking a neurodiverse child to compulsorily answer a question is going to possibly leave them separating in, in shame. What's your, so what's your methodology when it comes to questioning in class? You know, what's, what's, what's the way to do it if, if slant isn't the way to do it when it comes to ask and answer or cold calling, as they call it in TLA? That's a totally different conversation. In the, I've got probably about 50, yeah, not just the one. And this is a problem with, I, yeah, I salute some of the achievements that the profession has made in the last 10 years. Um, however, the, the key thing for me is the devaluation of the child's voice in their own education, the devaluation of, for instance, theatre studies, the devaluation of drama, the devaluation of anything that helps a working child, and you know, I was one of them, that helps a working child develop their skills of articulation and their de development of their skills of argumentation, because they're going to need those. But under the current pedagogic model, what we have is, is very, very constricted approaches to speaking and listening that, uh, that, have, that don't necessarily have the organic feel to them and the groove to them that others have. And equally, the teacher-led discussion I have always held to be one of the most inefficient teaching techniques there is. And that's what cold call is. It's initiation, a response, and I can't remember the last thing, IRA, evaluation, right? Having this one pedagogic technique in your palate to develop the speak, speaking and cognitive skills of your, your pupils seems infantile. It's incredibly inefficient. The teacher is the one doing all the intellectual somersaults, yeah? The teacher is the one that's developing their cognitive skills and developing their skills of articulation. And there's so many different, more democratic and student-based ways of organising discussion. It's, it's, yeah, I, I find the thing risible. But, in, but I suppose what I'm getting at is, I know you mentioned like 50 or so, so I'm, I'm just sort of trying to get, get, get an alternative to the model of slant. That's what I'm trying to get at, is, is one of the things they say in slant is ask and answer. So ask a question, student answers. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a low intellectual level and such a low degree of thought. Yeah, and, and it's clear that this is a person that was really very new to teaching and had very little experience. Incidentally, uh, Mr. Lemoff does not like his techniques being criticised. I received a furious, furious tweet last night from him, after which, two minutes after which, and this, I'm sure it's entirely coincidental, my access to Twitter stopped. I'm sure it's coincidental. I don't think Elon Musk is. is no, I no, I just, one doesn't know how much influence people have. <laughs> oh, come on, Phil. You think, <laughs> you think Douglas Mobs chatting with Elon Musk on DMs? You, you just put words into my mouth. Well, did, I suggest, that? did I suggest that at any point? You intimated that your oh, the shutting down of Twitter had something to do with you falling out with Douglas Mob. That. What the? Hell? That's right. what you've just yeah. intimated. Carry on. I, I'm sorry. Do you find me the object of humour? No, I'm That's just asking. Sure. I'm not I sure. I'm, I'm not sure I'm finding you the object of humour at the moment. I'm just asking why. I, th I mean, you mentioned Lamarve and sort of. Well, he doesn't, I, like, okay, well, doesn't like criticism of his. I, I, I'm trying to have an interview to discuss the content of your yeah, blog. Yeah, interviewers generally let people speak. Let's forget the fact that, yeah, my access to Twitter, right? yeah, it's paranoid on my part, obviously. But he did send me an unbelievably irate tweet. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm. I, I'm here and dis discussing with you. All right, it's quite heated because I find your approach unnecessarily disrespectful. But I'm still here doing it. Um, whereas Mr. Lamov, I would be happy to sit on a panel with Mr. Lamov and discuss pedagogy. 
I'd, I'd, I'd quite enjoy that, provided he could retain control of his temper. Do you think, like, I want to sort of go into some of the other bits. So you mentioned um, the sort of word, and you, you mentioned it, and it's a word you don't like within, within um, I think it's within TLAC, but also within SLAM, which is non-compliance. Or non, I think it was yeah, non-compliers was it or non? <laughs> yeah, there's much. I think I'd say there's much talk of non non-compliers or non-compliance. I can't remember which. Yeah, non-compliers, non-compliance, right? So, what I mean to me, Could you that read is, what, what, have I said something about what I think of that? No, that's what I'm going to ask you. I, I, well, I think I was, I this is a disgustingly bureaucratic way to speak about another human being. I mean, I mean, I was just going to ask, say that surely a non-complier is any any student who does not or will not follow an instruction in class. That's non-compliance. Oh, from, do you from... know much about language? Because I do. Yeah, that is a deeply bureaucratic way of speaking about a human. These are humans. To describe a human as a non-complier is fascistic. And obviously so as well to anyone with half a mind. Do you, do you I mean, what, what would be the alternative to non You know, like if we were to look for an alternative word or someone who doesn't follow instructions? A student. No, no, but the behaviour, though, of not following an instruction. A student. They're a student. A student. If they've got problems with self-regulation, when there'll, there'll be a reason behind that, and we'll find it. To label them non-compliers dehumanizes them. It disgusts me. Do you? Because, because uh, with 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 that phrase um, <laughs> of sort of non non-complier, do do you? So so in the next bit from there, um, you you've mentioned sort of this idea that. I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, sh surely, so in, in a school environment, or in a classroom environment, students need to follow instructions. Do, do you agree with that? They need to follow teacher instruction. I I, again, yeah, it, it, the difficulty with an interview situation is that you're asked for things off the bat. And, and I probably think there's a more profound philosophical question there to be answered than I'm capable of answering at the moment. On a surface level, yeah, it's important that kids follow instructions, absolutely. But I think there's a philosophical level as to who's given the instructions, how those instructions are being given, and whether those instructions are good for the child or bad. Um. Again, though, there will be those who will say, well, the teacher in a classroom setup, a teacher has to be the one giving out the instructions. A teacher has to give instructions. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Who, in, in, a, in a truly outstandingly managed class, behaviorally, it's the students that actually moderate each other's behavior. Yeah. But to, but to sort of create that in the first instance, surely there needs to be some form of instruction from the teacher. Yeah, I think you're treating, right, Tom, you're treating me as if I'm an early career teacher and I'm not. Yeah, you, I, you're, you're saying such profoundly low level things that, yeah, pitch it up a bit, will you? Well, I'm sorry I've disappointed you. I, I'm just trying to, I think it's important to, to get into the actual technicalities of this, what it is asking well, teachers just, to do. Because that's what it is. It's a teaching strategy. I think the philosophical element of it is rather more important than the technical element. The technical element of it is pretty visible. The philosophical element is frightening. Okay, let, let's go on the philosophical, try and go in, onto, onto the philosophical level of it. On a philosophical level, what are the things about slant that anger you the most? 
You're attempting to control a person's very being, to control their habitus. You're giving them compulsory uh, instructions to do something which is completely pointless. Nod at the teacher. Completely pointless. Look at the teacher at all times. You are transforming sometimes vulnerable young humans into Pavlovian dogs. It is risible. The fact that it has such got, got such a grounding or a infests our profession so so deeply i find it, it's very difficult to think of an adjective disparaging enough for it without re resorting to even more profanities philosophically it revolts me and philosophically i think it is damaging and given that the people that invented it accept that it's coercive control and abusive it's continued support from figures of the far right persuasion in our profession is to me just a confirmation that we've made a move towards the, the, the Overton window has, has gone so far right that we're in, and I'll be careful with my language here, a precursor to a version of fascism. <laughs> But why, how, why, are you how, laughing? why are you laughing? Because because I I'm I, I want to ask, I said? Yes, I did. I, I want to ask how a teaching technique or strategy can be a precursor to fascism. It's a uh, teaching uh, strategy. So I, right, I, I have to be honest, mate. I don't think you're clever enough to interview me. Okay. You you you're really you're a bit blunt intellectually, and and unless you can pitch it up, I think we'll draw it to a close. Because you're just being silly. Okay, no problem, no problem. I mean, I, I think I'm asking relevant questions. I'm certainly trying to. Um, but if that's how you feel, that's absolutely fine. All right, okay, yeah, I think we'll leave it there. Okay. Okay, um, thanks, Phil. How do I get out of this? Uh, hang on. Got it, I've got it.